have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello and welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and this is episode 49, and we are recording on March 22nd, 2015. And let me introduce you to my awesome, esteemed co-host of cinema. First off, to your left, my left, is James Sullivan, also known as Jaime Dude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by everyone's favorite game show host, the Hungry Hungry Nipples. It's a reference. Did that joke make sense, Mike, or did you just laugh because he said nipples? No, no, it, it's a reference joke. Uh. <laughs> um, it's a kind of a long story if you don't know that reference slash joke. Okay, then I don't care. Introduce, you don't care introduce at all. Introduce me! That's what the public wants. Mm-hmm. The public wants the female on the right, also known as Jada Jada. Of course you don't. You what, don't. What is there? He, he takes a Sesame Street thing all the damn time. <laughs> it's original. Ba- basically, that's a shtick. <laughs> so, this episode, we are missing Matt, of course. He is by this week. He's on vacation. So, he'll be back two weeks from now for the Eddie Murphy episode. Mm. In the meantime, we're going to talk about Keanu Reeves and his films. Keanu Reeves. Oh, Keanu Reeves. How do we describe your acting? My dad likes to bother there... me by saying his acting is flawless. <laughs> like, whenever I, bring up, whenever I bring up Keanu Reeves, he goes, Oh, you mean the actor with flawless acting? And I'm like... <laughs> okay. His acting is like a cool breeze over the mountains. That's what his name means in Hawaiian. Oh yeah. Yeah, Keanu is Hawaiian. And he's not Hawaiian. And amazingly enough, I, I just have to bring this up because um, it, it's a, a mind-blowing fact. Say what say what you will about his. Uh, about his acting, but he is he is worth three hundred and fifty million dollars, according to CelebrityNetWorth.com. You are just so obsessed with with figuring out these ransom sums for every actor that we talk about. Why is that <laughs> thing for you, James? I don't know. I sort of caught on to it well. lately. Why is it so it's important like for you to know what you would get if you sold an actor? <laughs> It's like real estate. That it's this is how much you buy. It's like trading cards, you know, somebody has the <laughs> Mike, you can't do a spit take. You weren't even drinking anything. I wasn't. I don't have anything fucking left. Uh do you, do you have a Keanu Reeves card? I do. You want to trade for it? <laughs> well you have to give me do you have any celebrities worth uh worth a, a cumulative sum of three hundred and fifty million? So you get you get like these other two celebrities, and you you do the math and you three or two celebrities and you're like okay, I'll I'll add up Jim Carrey, and uh, Dana Carvey and you know. I feel like a after celebrity trading card game would be insanely fucking expensive. Because <laughs> think of all the people you'd need to get rights to. At least baseball mm-hmm. people are all on the same team, you know. You can talk to the same right. people once. All right. God, that would be insane. Uh, let's start off with this early, early career. I mean, people might know Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, of course, but some people might know some something a little called uh, Babes in Toyland. Explain, James. Uh, yes. Before the Matrix, before Speed, before Bill and Ted, there was... Babes in Toyland. 
Uh, okay, so... Uh, where shall I begin with this one? This, uh, a lot of folks I know are familiar with the, uh, with the, the Disney version of Babes in Toyland, which in and of itself was also based on, um, uh, what, what was it, uh, I, I guess you could just call it a, a play or an operetta. Uh, it was a that ballet. Was, it was a ballet. Okay, so it was a ballet slash operetta slash whatever. Um, in the early, uh, I, I think it was the 1910s, 1920s. Don't quote me on that. Back when ballets but, were, you know, a thing. Yeah. As opposed to that, now when they're a thing for five-year-olds. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I know ballet is a respected field. Just making jokes here. Yes, yeah, back when ballet was more than just the Nutcracker, we had Babes in Toyland. Uh, so uh, this this version, um, they they take uh, every every couple of decades or so, they they create a, a version of Babes in Toyland that's either the ballet or a story that's based on the ballet or based around the ballet and that's where we get the Disney version from the 1960s and this version from 1986 starring Drew Barrymore and Keanu Reeves now this uh, this particular incarnation of Babes in Toyland was one that I actually used to watch uh, uh, quite frequently around the age of six and seven, and I think that's that's a, that's probably the best age group that's uh, uh, to watch it at because that's really the only age group that that it's aimed at. It might be aimed at a at a family audience, but um, it's uh, it is the story. It is the story of Babes in Toyland with uh, a modern character thrown in. And if you're not familiar with the story of Babes in Toyland, we have uh, a young, happy couple living in Toyland uh, who love each other, but she has to marry. Uh, she has to marry the bad guy Barnaby, who's uh, who lives uh, outside the town. And there's also a, a subplot with a toy maker. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a child friendly a, a child friendly Romeo and Juliet slash uh, Dudley Do Right. I'm I'm grasping at straws for that comparison. I don't know about Dudley Do Right. So well, I guess they, some of them wear red suits. Dudley Do Right wore a red suit. <sighs> I, I say that I say that I say that because uh, I say that because the the villain Barnaby is a, is a snidely whiplash. Yeah, but you know, he's guy, also every other cartoon villain of the eighties. You could just as easily say it's part the Smurfs. What this uh, what this particular incarnation of Babes in Toyland does is it seems to it seems to merge uh, the story of Babes in Toyland with concepts previously found in um, the Wizard of Oz. We have we have Drew Barrymore as a as a eleven year old character in this film. Uh, this was this was her being a child actress after movie after movies like E. T. were popular. As she, as she's the lead character in this story, and she has, she has all these friends in her in real life set in Cincinnati, Ohio. And then, one night she gets into a, a sledding accident, conks out, and next thing you know she's, off in Toyland, Toyland, every child's dream is Toyland. Uh, and 
what do you know just like with just like with the Wizard of Oz all of her friends and one enemy that she knows from real life are also playing characters in Toyland and that's where Keanu Reeves comes in he in in real life in in the real life of uh, the character of of Drew Barrymore, he's uh, he's her older sister's boyfriend who works at a toy store. And in in Toyland, he plays Jack B. Nimble, who's who is set to marry uh, Mary Contrary. And they they have to stop uh, they have to stop Barnaby from uh, from ruining the wedding and whatnot and getting in between them, and he's got some sort of he's got some sort of plan to take over uh, Toyland. I I noticed something funny about every version of Babes in Toyland though. When you think Babes in Toyland, you're thinking Babes in Toyland. But I'm lo I'm watching this movie and I'm saying I see a toy land. I don't see any babes. I'm thinking like babies or anything. I think babes meant something different in that era. Maybe it did. <laughs> Dude, where's the babes at? They're gonna be in the toy land somehow, bro. Oh, well, well, you got Drew Barrymore who grew up who grew up to be a babe. Yeah, so you guys are such guys. <laughs> it is like the Wizard of Oz is so weird. Yeah, so, so so weird. Well well notice I turned around at at first and I said babies, not babes as in right. as in right. you know, I hunting know. down girls and whatnot. I know. Babies in Toyland was I believe the Rugrats version. <laughs> It's true. I'm not kidding. It is. It is. Well, it well, is. I just thought of that. I remember that. Let's right. see. Uh, who directed this? Uh, Clive Donner. Now, why is that uh, familiar? Oh, yeah. He directed What's New Pussycat and the Christmas Carol adaptation with George C. Scott. Also explains why he's not familiar. You know? Well, it, that... It, it, some people, I'm not saying me, but well, for like, yeah, I like the 1982 Christmas Carol, so I guess that's why I'm familiar with it. Because he's an old fart; he knows everything. The yeah, the original version of this was a TV movie. Yes, I guess uh, TV movies count in this podcast. They do. They which do. Which was a. T... Mm hmm I mean the. They're films, but they're on television, so what? They're the same. They work. Which was a two-night event on, N I think it was NBC. It is NBC. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the IMDb, it clocked in at 140 minutes in its full running length, but the version that I always watched was the one that landed on video, which, which cuts out... Yep. It's shortened to 94 minutes. Yeah, it cuts out a significant chunk of the musical numbers, mainly. And I guess, uh, I guess, I guess I sort of missed out because I didn't, I, uh, I didn't get to see Keanu Reeves singing. Mm-hmm, yeah, that's, that's a, the deleted scenes. Singing in jail, or Drew Barrymore in the cast playing a jailbreak, that's when Keanu Reeves and... Mary was in the jail. Mm -hmm. and, and this is this is also why I wanted to to bring this this movie up to this podcast is that even though it's not it's not straight up a Keanu Reeves film. No. Nope. Uh, he's he's just a, a supporting character a bit, in the film. Yep. A bit player. Yeah. This is this is one of the early examples of what he was doing with his career and it's such a, a stark contrast to what he later became known for 
Exactly. You don't you don't know when you think Keanu Reeves, you don't you don't think of him doing family films. Although know, I here kinda, I kinda thought huh? of his character in Babes in Toyland as being a little bit Bill and Ted esque. Like he before Bill and Ted esque. Yeah, but he kinda had like that doofy sort of caricature going on. Have you Minus, seen the movie or I've seen the movie. Like oh, years, you have. years and years ago. Years and years and years and years and years ago. Years and mm-hmm. Years and years, 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 years ago. So uh, for my ago. celebrity ransom of, uh, for for my celebrity ransom of ba- of Keanu Reeves, I request all the copies of Babes in Toyland. Uh, that won't that won't amount to one hundred thirty five million dollars. No, I mean it was always released on VHS. I mean it's not on DVD now, or we'll be, I mean we'll be lucky if it clocks ten million. Let's be real here. <laughs> It act- but yeah, see, I, I think it, I also read that it uh, it aired in theaters overseas. Yeah, in Europe. Yeah, Europe. It, I was reading that too. I was like, the European theatrical version. I was like, oh, it must have had a theater run in Europe, which is interesting. Where, because I guess it does make sense. That it was filmed in Germany during the summer of '86, then released. You know, it must have been released. You know, during the you know, sometime 86 in Europe, and then later on broadcast at NBC in December of 86. So it wasn't really shot in Cincinnati? Oh. No. For a yeah, film was, that... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a film that takes place in Cincinnati. It, it, it was shot in West Germany. It, well, it's not just the fact that it, it's shot in Cincinnati. It's the fact that it loves Cincinnati. You know they've got they've got musical numbers based around based Chicago around the city of city was Cincinnati. Shot in Toronto, okay. Well, Chicago ter- was shot in Toronto. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Oh, so yeah, I mean, they try to make the illusion that it's taking place somewhere else in film, but in reality, it's filmed somewhere else. It's That's all about movie magic. Film. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I think it's newsworthy if a movie does get filmed on location. Yeah, let's see. yeah that's the, 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 yeah. Uh, right, we can't we can't film there. We gotta film somewhere else close to it. Like we can't film in New York, so we gotta film in Toronto. Or Vancouver. More often it's Vancouver because I guess it looks more New York-y. That could Big be. Things are expensive. Yeah, I shot a I shot a movie around here. Uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, we we basically said the move this part of the movie takes place in Texas, but um, uh, nobody would be able to know that because we shot out in the woods and well, woods are woods. We'll just have all right, have yeah. People show up wearing cowboy hats. You're good. Mm-hmm. Know the Roland Emmerich strategy. Yeah, think of the think of the biggest stereotype you can think of when. Uh, when thinking about Texas and have people dressed like that walk in. Grant, wait, what are you doing here? Well, it is Texas. I guess you're right. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. I yeah. come from CINCI and ATT as Cincinnati. Yeah, so... That was 86, you know, three years later, you know, he would land the big, big breakout role of Bill and Ted and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Funny enough that in Bill and Ted, they were auditioning, Alex Winter and Keanu were actually auditioning for the opposite role until they flip-flopped the roles for the film. Because I guess it made that much they were paired up together like, I'm auditioning for Bill. I'm auditioning for Ted. Oh, wait, you'll be suited with that role better. Eventually, that got a sequel called Bogus, and now they're working on a third one, which I heard they're doing like halfway through now. Let's, let's, like right in the script. Let's see how much Keanu Reeves can pull off being the doofy college kid in his 50s. 
not? Or maybe they'll go the dumb and dumber route and have like decades go by. We'll see. I believe that's what they're doing. I believe I don't remember do what the plot was, person. Oh yeah, there's there's it's no way. From what, from what I from what I heard, they were just uh, like they never like grew up. They're still the same, you know, dude, man. Again, for the dumb and dumber. Mm-hmm. But yeah, then around the same time as Bogus Jerry, you got a film called Point Break. The everlasting action film starring Keanu Reeves and Patrick Stu- uh, Patrick Swayze. Patrick Stewart. St- <laughs> that would have been interesting. Patrick Stewart. What a team up! Nobody saw that one. <laughs> Patrick Stewart as a as a <laughs> as bank a surfer. robbing surfer dude. <laughs> For sake. We are the ex presidents. Fuck me. Patrick Swayze, goddamn. Patrick's in Hollywood. Ah! I recognize you. You're Johnny Utah. <laughs> starring. Make it. Starring Keanu Reeves and Patrick Starr. Wait, no. Ah. <laughs> Too many Patricks in the world. Yes, basically, Point Break is a film set in California, um, and something you may notice with most of those films with Keanu Reeves, he does play characters named John and or Johnny. I believe there's at least five or six roles he's played that are named John or Johnny. And actually, in this episode, we're going to talk about three of the Johns oh, he's played. Whoa. Like, seriously. Like, he's he's looking. Whoa. Whenever a fun fact pops up. Whoa. Rugrats Babes in Toyland was called Babies in Toyland. Whoa. 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 Yes, he plays Johnny Utah in Point Break. He's a ex-football player because he tore a tore something couldn't play anymore so he decided to go into the FBI be an FBI agent and then he gets on a case you know he gets teamed up with actually Gary Busey in the film and he has to solve his crime of these ex-presidents these guys dressed in these ex-presidents max with um, Reagan Nixon. Carter. Um, Carter. What was the other one? There was four of Nixon, them. Uh, let's see. Was it LBJ in there? Yes, LBJ. There we go. That's the ex-presidents. And they and they, they couldn't figure out, like, who, who, who are robbing these banks after another, after another? And K- Gary Busey's like, you know what? I got a theory. They're surfers. And Keanu Reeves is like, all right, I'm going to follow your lead. I'm going to learn how to surf on the FBI agent's uh, salary. You know, FBI, the FBI's gonna pay me to surf, man. And this leads up with, you know, Keanu Reeves meeting Patrick Swayze, his group of people, and he eventually realize, spoiler alert, that they are the ex-presidents, and it leaves into this cat and mouse kind of thing where they're trying to catch each other. You know, there's surfing, there's skydiving. It's just, it's kind of where the can evolves into this action star. It's kind of where he started, pretty much, when it comes to action, close to, before The Matrix, mm-hmm. and before Speed. It kind of is funny, because it represents a literal translation from, or transition from Surfer Dude into Action Star. Exactly. Like, did he do exactly. that on purpose? Because that's bizarrely fitting. I don't know. It would have been very fitting if he did that on purpose. Maybe he'll have to make Point Break 2 before he makes Bill and Ted 2, in which he quits the FBI well, and becomes a surfer again. Well, well, the funny thing is that this year, there is a remake of Point Break coming out. A remake? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They are remaking it. They are remaking it's it, and it's coming out. A movie. I know. It's not even been. It's been like 10, 15 years since then. 25 yeah, years. Even... Keanu Reeves still has an action movie career. You gotta at least wait until he's washed up before you try replacing him. Come on, Hollywood. Well, he almost did that with Man of Tai Chi, but uh, I see what you mean. That I understand. <laughs> so yes, uh, coming this Christmas is Point Break. There's very little information about it, so there's no trailers, no posters, no nothing yet. So 
We'll just have to see how it goes. Hey, you know, Hollywood, they do remakes perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see how that works. All time. Yep, and I'm looking at this cast list for the remake, and I don't recognize a single name. Except maybe exactly. uh, Teresa Palmer. Where have I heard that before? Oh, Warm Bodies. Uh, <laughs> Warm bodies. Oh god, that. What an interesting next project. What about the director? Who's directing? Uh, we have uh, directing Eric Erickson Core. Eric Erickson. Erickson Core. Erickson Core. It sounds like a company. The. Uh... <laughs> what has he done? He's gonna... I was gonna say I don't think he's established himself as a director. No, but he was the cinematographer for Daredevil. <laughs> Not a director, a cinematographer. Cinematographer. You should never have someone's first project be an adaptation in directing. That there should be a rule Just, against that. It never goes well. You gotta have someone with experience in original stuff to I, do that. I I mean, there are some good cinematographers turned directors. I mean, John Debont. Well, with exactly. speed. If you, want, speed, yep. and... if you want to break into the world of directing, do it with something original. Do not do an adaptation, because you are setting yourself up for failure. Exactly. It's like, if you fail on that, what's your next project going to be? You're not going to get a next project afterwards. You're going to alienate people. People are going to just start comparing you to other directors right off the bat. You don't want that. You want to make like I said, we uh, definitely see what happens. So that's why. So with the original Point Break, um, I, I saw this for the first time myself uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I noticed something about it. Reeves, he, he's always caught flack for his acting skills, um, and watching this movie, it's it's showing, it, it's showing here. You know, there there are certain limitations to his acting, and some. Some, uh, th there's some wiggle room also, I should say. He's good at, he's good at playing, we've already established, he's, he's good at playing dudes. But, um, with, uh, with this film, uh, I noticed that he's able to, he's actually able to, uh, bring, bring in character transformation over time with uh, with the the way that his character starts out at first you know Johnny Utah formerly formerly working uh, as a football player now working for the the FBI he's uh, he shows up in a suit and tie in the in the beginning of the film and he's he's all very business he's very serious about everything Right. And so they hire him they hire him to become uh, or pose as a surfer. And so he goes through his training and everything and big big spoiler I guess he becomes a surfer. But when you when you see him become a surfer uh there are little subtle nuances in his in his performance. That actually sell. That actually sell this type of character transformation. You know, he's he's not just been give, He's not just given. He's not just being given a surfboard. And told to told to walk around. He, when he walks around as a surfer, he's got he's got swagger. He's got a little bit of attitude going on. It's not too too much, but it's enough to show that. Uh, Johnny Utah as a character is transforming. So mm -hmm. there's 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 some subtleties there, and I think that actually that actually works with uh, uh, with the with the performance. Oh yeah, yeah, I noticed that right. I was like, wow, it's like layering of acting going on there. Of course, he can't when it it. Still, he hits the wall a little bit though with a when he does a, a shouting match with Gary Busey. 
I am an FBI agent. Yeah, of course, when you're when you're in a shouting match with Gary Busey, you're gonna lose. But um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, in any case, you know. Keanu, yeah, Reeves, Keanu Reeves kind of has this problem where he often gets outclassed by the people he works with. Like whatever yeah. cool actor he has is usually better than him. Usually, usually. We're gonna talk. Usually, we're gonna, yeah. We're gonna talk about the Matrix later, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, it's coming up. Usually. It's coming up. Usually. Uh, and this is actually a, a great segue to the next film we should talk about is, um, let's talk about Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh, can we? Pretty please? Yes, we, pretty yes, nice. we can. We can. Every sleep I it came, it, it, it came out right after Point Break in 92, so... It has Keanu Reeves in it. Again, not a not a Keanu Reeves movie per se, but right, right, he's a bit player in it. it. Yeah. T- talking about you know Keanu Reeves' controversy, I guess if you can call it a controversy when it comes to his acting, Dracula is somewhat and some something of an infamous example of that. Like when people when people think about oh god, Keanu Reeves is such a terrible actor, they don't honestly. They don't honestly go to Matrix or Bill and Ted first. They usually go to Dracula first. And I think the reason for that honestly has to do with the movie itself being very much not a Keanu Reeves appropriate film. Like, it's, it's Dracula. It, it's as Dracula as Dracula could possibly be. Directed by Kenneth Br- Francis. No, not Kenneth Br- No, Francis, Francis Ford Coppola. I don't know why I thought of Kenneth Branagh. Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah, he did Frankenstein. Did he? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. That, yeah, and they're in the same box set together. Okay. I got it. Anyway. Yep. It was the Universal movies of the early 90s. <laughs> uh, Francis Ford mm-hmm. Coppola picture, it's, it's like heavy and dramatic. It's all gothic because it's a story of Dracula. It's a depressing story. It's, it's in Europe which is kind of a thing, although I don't think anybody actually really speaks Transylvanian. Everybody kind of tries to speak English, although I guess... Yeah, Dracula's supposed to be Transylvanian. Everybody else lives in England. And Dracula's played by Gary Oldman, a British actor. You're either talking mm-hmm. like this, or like this. Uh... Gary Oldman very much sells the role of Dracula perfectly, but he doesn't have the best Transylvanian accent in the world. Not that I think anybody can really decipher what the best Transylvanian accent in film is, because they're always over the top. It's like one of the worst accents to find an authentic version of. I, uh, I'd I'd be surprised to hear you say that, because I haven't heard the, I haven't seen the film, but Gary Oldman is one of the greatest actors. Oh, he's a fantastic actor, and he does the role superbly. But, mm-hmm. but the Transylvanian accent is a little too I thought too soft your blood. You know? A little, a little <laughs> well, what do you expect with Dracula? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> All the same. His Transylvanian accent is utterly authentic compared to yeah. Keanu Reeves' attempt at speaking like a British man. Which pe- pe- right. pe- people shit on what all the writers attempt at a British accent vastly superior like I didn't even notice how bad hers was with Keanu Reeves walking around sounding like so utterly not British that it wasn't even funny I don't even half of the time he didn't even try to sound British he just sounded like Keanu Reeves oh well and I think he felt he had the wrong idea about what this movie was trying to be I think he kind of got a little too caught up in the gothic style and you know, kind of got into too much of a sleepy hollow mindset. Like, he didn't think this movie was going to be taken as seriously as it was. And there's right. so many scenes that are, like, gripping and dramatic and get ruined that. by his mugging. The absolute uh, worst okay. one. And it should be the best moment in the movie is when he... Dracula finally shows up and you see him for the first time. And he, like, has this baby. And he gives the baby to his three vamp minions. And they eat the baby. This all happened in the book. Uh, I haven't read the book. I read a comic version of the book, but 
since it happened in that, I'm assuming. Anyway. Like, and, like, they're eating the baby, and the music is swelling as it's happening, and it's, like, this horrible thing, and Gary Oldman just claps his hand and lets out this horrible, sinister, like, <laughs> kind of laugh, and it's, like, you want to get into it, but then it keeps cutting to Keanu Reeves, who's just, like, inches away from the camera, going, no, no, don't eat the baby. So <laughs> back the fuck up, Keanu Reeves. We're trying to enjoy Gary Oldman here. You're ruining the scene. Francis Ford Coppola. He, you think he'd be smarter than this? Like, why make that casting decision? You you made Anthony Hopkins and and Gary Oldman. Those those were good. You seem to be paying attention on those days. Why Keanu Reeves? I want to know. Was nobody All available right. to play the boring love interest character? Like, really? You want to know? You really want to know? I really <clears> want to know. Why Keanu Reeves? Co Coppola said on his casting choice, we try to get some kind of matinee idol, which is a uh, actor or theater actor who's got ma massive fans like Keanu Reeves does, for the part of Jonathan. Because it, it isn't such a great part. Um, if we all go to the airport, Keanu is the one that girls would just besiege. Just because he's popular, he got casted. Did Keanu Reeves have a lot of fangirls in the 90s? Uh, yeah. Was, were there girls going to watch Bill and Ted in theaters going, ah, 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 Was that a thing? I don't remember that being a thing. Not that I that was... That probably I, was... I mean, that's why that's why he was casted, because he's the most popular choice. <laughs> you could have got fucking anybody. You could have gotten, I don't know. And like and like Coppola said, it wasn't a great part, so they had to cast somebody to do the part, anyways. Uh. You could have cast fucking Leonardo DiCaprio. He would have done a great job. You could have cast, I don't know. <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't the the <laughs> big. He wasn't the big actor of the time. No, no, it was yeah, because Titanic didn't come out until later. Yeah. There must have been somebody you could have chosen other than Keanu Reeves. I feel like that was a lazy way of deciding who could play that character. Just because a character seems like it's the boring, heroic type does not mean that you should be lazy with how you treat him. Phantom of the Opera had the exact same problem in, like, almost every adaptation of it with fucking Raul. You can make this character interesting. Just effort. Effort. <laughs> oh, my God. There, there's like a whole section about Keanu Reeves here on the Wikipedia page, and uh, in Entertainment Weekly they described uh, as having been him as been out of death and uh, frequently blasted off screen by Keanu uh, <laughs> Gary Oldman. Yeah. He was blasted off the screen by Gary Oldman. Talk about being outclassed, like Jesus! It, it was like trying to eat eat a hungry man while at the Ritz. Oh, he's uh, embarrassing. Just looking at the, just looking at the cast list here, I think everyone, everyone here, uh, could have out could have out acted Keanu Reeves, even when on a writer. Even when on a but, like, that, that was a that made sense as a casting choice because she was known for being the chick who was in gothic stuff at the time. Mm -hmm, a, right. Mm -hmm. That made Let's sense. Let's see. But uh, you know who I'd really like to see here out act Keanu Reeves. Who? I'll give you a hand. Anthony Hopkins? Do you lack bubbles? <laughs> Fucking Oki loves. Fucking Carrie loves. Carrie El Elwes is in this movie too. Yes. What? I what don't did remember you that. I don't remember this that either. Is what? This movie, goddammit. Why, why are there things I don't know? <laughs> The more you know. Can you Does can he, you see that? Whoa. Do you lack play... bubbles? Whoa. Do Does, you lack he... bubbles? Does he play one of the, the red-headed chick's boyfriends? I feel like that would be the only place to put him. <laughs> Lord God. Arthur Homewood. So yes, is... one of the red-headed chick's boyfriends. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Another actor total... who could have done the character better than Keanu Reeves. But there you go. He, he could have just so, said, as you wish, and uh, 
and he's got a race who would have been out and he as robin hood men in tights will tell you can speak with an authentic british accent whoa for the win wow a couple of total film writers commented about it and he says it was a dreary milky nothing a black hole of sex and drama um you can visibly see Kano attempting to end every one of his lines with dude. <laughs> the result? A performance that looks like the young actors... Oh, looks like he was constipated. Keanu really dragged the entire movie down. Like, Painful for been, all parties. It could have been an absolutely spectacular classic, and it almost was. But because Keanu Reeves had to be in it so much, it, it, it's merely good. Well, here's, yeah, here's, uh, here, here's the thing. It, it, it sounds like a lot of people are trashing it, and I know, and I know some people who have seen it personally who, who have trashed it, but I can't say anything because I have not seen it. Lord knows Maybe I will one day. Lord knows um, film. If it's, I, if it's so bad to, to so many people, it, it looks like it's got mm, really pretty, pretty. Pretty good ratings, I should say. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all it's all high ratings, but the only thing they pick about is Keanu Reeves. Lord mm. knows, Goth Lord knows, Gothic film lore has a habit of being polarizing. Speaking of which, did you know that they're trying to make a remake of The Crow? Yes, or, I did or, know that. A reboot, I should say, because it's based on yeah. the comics. Would, yes, a reboot of The Crow. Yes. I'd be interested to see that. I don't necessarily think it would go as well with today's audience as it did in the '90s when everybody, <laughs> when being punk it, was cool. It could. It could. I don't know. Like what? But yeah, I just. Rock fans could they get for it? Paramore. Oh, I was oh, gonna say that. Oh yeah, that's right. Trying to get some. I guess they could dig way underground and pull up Slipknot, but then that would make their movie alienating and lord knows hollywood doesn't like that god it probably wouldn't yeah. even be right far <laughs> yeah it'd be one of those pg-13 films <laughs> yeah we have uh oh oh here's here's something I, I couldn't help but notice we also have uh uh monica bellucci playing one of dracula's wives oh really mm -hmm. that's a oh wow oh wait Whoa. 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 Yeah, she's she's on fire right now, actually. Oh yeah. Uh, um, she's she's been on fire. Um, per se. And ironically, she shows up in another Keanu Reeves movie. Yeah. Or set of Keanu Reeves movies. But anyway. Are um, we done? Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I want to say, just, yeah, everybody just picks on Keanu Reeves because he doesn't have a good English accent, you know, he's, I, I guess they're having issues with his accents, and it's been labeled as the, the top ten worst movie so accents. So much more than the accent, though. Basically, if, you want, if you're curious about what people's problem with Keanu Reeves' acting is, and you want to see the epitome of that, watch Dracula, and you'll understand him at his yep. worst. Not his so worst movie, go... but his worst performance. Yes, yes. One of his infamously bad roles. Uh, we go from Bram Stoker's Dracula to the most, one of the most iconic roles that Keanu Reeves has received. Uh, actually, originally, Will Smith was casted in that role, but Keanu Reeves snatched that role from Will Smith. And it was Neo for The Matrix. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, yeah, Will Smith but... had better things to do. With, with Kenneth yeah, had, Conner yeah. and of Kevin Klein. He totally has no regrets. Yeah, yeah. Will, Will Smith, I, I... I honestly can't see the role going to him unless, uh, unless we're talking about the circa... Uh, circa later years, Will Smith, not the uh, Men in Black Will Smith they of the would time. Have altered, they would have altered the role a lot to fit his Will Smithy character. That he's oh yeah. Playing. They would have changed the oh. movie, probably for the oh. worse. But so you know, maybe, maybe mean, Will Wild Wild West was worth it after all. 
<laughs> yes, he was doing he was doing more important projects like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which which yeah, I, I actually don't have anything against Wild Wild West per se. No, no, really? it's really it's... because you should because it was a terrible fucking movie. It's it's a guilty it's it's, it's a guilty pleasure. It's a guilty pleasure. I, I have a I have a thing for westerns and I'm you know for westerns too when they're good. Oh. Well, I mean, it's <laughs> ooh, Snapola. Anyways, the Matrix. Yes. What? You're talking about the whole saga of the Matrix, just to let everybody know. Not not just the first film. He's gonna. He's going to overview the whole franchise for you. Well, here's the thing. Uh, when this, when these movies started out, well, particularly with the first film, oh my god, it was such a big deal. I remember I was, I was a freshman in high school. You know, this was, this was a movie that, that didn't just come out, but after it came out, it was, it was being shouted from the rooftops uh oh, yeah. it was it it was spawning its fan circles online the the trailer was getting tons of downloads it it had tons of trailers to download um and uh fans were fans were making up their own uh versions online they were uh, they, I remember someone made a mock-up trailer using uh, three-dimensional South Park characters. As uh, so, if you can Im if you can imagine those characters reenacting the the trailer for the Matrix, that's the kind of thing that people were were making about this film because it was it was such a big deal. You know, fans were putting effort, a lot of effort, into their into their love for this film and it uh, for for a while it was but with uh, you know you know you, you do have the the hero's journey at play here with the with the first film kind of a, a character going into a different world becoming uh, discovering that he has a destiny and uh, what do you know? He is the one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, with the sequels coming out, the the Wachowskis tried to get bigger and better with the with the films, and this was a time period in which it felt like it felt like the return the return of the trilogy. You know, this was the the rebirth of the trilogy era. You had other movies coming out like uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy alongside this. Lord for of the example. Rings had a much bigger hand in bringing back trilogies than the Matrix did. Let's be honest with ourselves. I'm I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it didn't. I mean, okay, so maybe, well, okay, so uh, Lord of the Rings has withstood maybe the test of time a little bit more because of the hobbit and it, the fact that it's got a fan base that spawns over a century and because but, they're good yeah um the matrix sequels come out and the fan base that that built up the the first film tore it down again all of a sudden, the the blowback against the uh, against the movies it was uh, it it was tremendous. Suddenly they were they were saying it, it these are the worst movies ever made, and this is why uh, because Neo and Trinity die in the third film. They were they were mad, and I guess. I, I guess uh, I, I guess they I guess they felt like um, fan fanboys fanboys and fangirls are interesting like that because they can uh, they can they can make you and then break you at the same time. But um, 
I always I always thought these thought these films, sequels included, they kind of. Uh, uh, for me, the the first one felt like a classic. The the ones that followed had some interesting twists and turns, but in the end, they're just they're just sort of fun action movies. The thing about the Wachowskis is that they have they have this thing where they're very high concept and very low everything else. Like, they don't put a lot of effort into their writing when it comes to actually, like, putting the stuff between point A and point B. They, they, just, they just have these visions in their heads of things that they want to put in a movie, and they show them, and then they sort of half-heartedly give you a reason why it's there. That seems to be their general oeuvre. Although I don't know if Matrix is the worst example of that. God, I want to see Jupiter something so bad, you guys. I was just going to ask that. Have you seen Jupiter Ascending yet? I want yet? to. Uh, I'm not a fan of the Matrix movies. I don't think they're the worst thing ever. I certainly don't think they're as good as the hype claims them to be. I think they're grossly overrated, or at least the first one is. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Because, like you said, the, the sequels are not massively beloved. <laughs> yeah, it's like the first film just makes it, it breaks it for everybody. They have, they have the potential of, to be fun action movies, if only people would talk less. Because even though they're high concept and low everything else, it's because they're, they put so little thought into what makes their deep notions and their morals and their visions there, it makes the, their actual attempts to be deep very insufferable. Like, I feel like half of the, the so-called profound shit you hear in the Matrix movie is stuff you get out of a fortune cookie. So it's like the most basic kind of philosophy. What if this world were not real? That's all it is. That's the simplest thing ever. You think the Matrix is the first movie to, to introduce that idea? No. No, but it had fun with it. I it thought, was, at least. I, I just... When, when they tried to act like they were so much smarter than they really were, like skimming through the philosophy book, making up these big scenes, the worst example is there's this one scene where Lawrence Fishburne and Keanu Reeves are going down a hallway. They're going to see the Oracle. Do you know the scene I'm talking about? Yes. They're going to see the Oracle. They go up to the door to the Oracle's little office. And I can only Lawrence show Fishburne, you the door. You have to go through it. Yeah. And he, he doesn't open the door for Keanu. He just sort of steps aside. Keanu's just like, what? I, I showed you the door, but you have to open it. And then he looks at the door like, whoa. And there's like this big moment. The music's building up. He reaches for the doorknob, and then the door opens on its own because somebody lets them in. So A, pointless because he doesn't even open the door himself. B, it's just a door. <laughs> like Lawrence Fishburne, it's, this isn't like a special step into the journey. It's just a door. There was no reason why you had to step aside and let him open it himself. There was, what did that add to his character? How was it character development that he was allowed to open the door? I get that maybe it was sort of foreshadowing, like, oh, he has to do stuff himself. That's not totally obvious for the protagonist to have to do in a movie. It seems like the most, it's just the most overblown, meaningless thing that's supposed to be like this big, and people quote it like it's the friggin' most profound thing in the world. It's like, no. It is. It, is, it represents what the rest of the movie is. Very intense, very kind of humorous, and very not at all deep or existential like it thinks it is. I, I always me, thought the big quoting... I, I thought the, the big quoting uh, moment was there is no spoon. Well, I guess there's multiple big quoting moments. And the spoon thing is sort of clever, I guess. Although it's, it's once again going from a, from a not very original... Like, like, it's virtual reality. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Like, like there's so many books, so many, like, works of fiction out there that have tackled these things and done so without being loaded about it. Have you guys, uh, have you guys also heard of this? Uh, there's a woman uh, named Sophia Stewart uh, who... Uh, who calls herself uh, the mother of the Matrix. I have not heard of that. Why is she the mother of the Matrix? 
Do tell. Well, James. she claims. Uh, she claims that um, uh, the the film, The Matrix, is actually based off of a, a screenplay that she sent that she sent into Hollywood back in the '80s, and there's this whole. Uh, there's this whole. Uh, uh, conspiracy theory about it. Uh, she's got a. Uh, she's got a. A website set up saying, "Okay, okay, this is new." Uh, Sophia Stewart. Uh, now she's claiming she wrote Terminator. Okay. <laughs> oh my okay. god. Okay. Oh, okay. What, what did you step into? <laughs> <laughs> out there that has a very similar plot to The Matrix, I don't think that's a sign of the Wachowskis being plagiarists, so much as it is of, once again, this not being a very original idea. Truth about Matrix. Like, like, yeah. You know who had a similar script to The Matrix? Like, so many Twilight Zone episodes. Are those writers gonna come out and call plagiarism? No. Because they know why the scripts are so similar. Because they write Twilight Zone and they're smart like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I find this, I find it baffling, though, because she's got this other story on here that she apparently wrote called The Third Eye, which is supposed to be the story that, uh, that inspired The Matrix, and it's, it's for sale on Amazon, but, uh, oh, oh, you know what, this is, uh, this must be really good publicity for her, ooh, she wrote a story, so so why not tie it to something else and say that they ripped her off? Um, she's if you look at the website, she's got all this stuff set up here: photos, videos, and legal stuff, saying that she's she's got or she's got a she's got a, a lawsuit pending or. Maybe either either she had some. There's some news sources saying that she actually wanted. But in all the time that I I have looked at her website, and it's been a while, so I could be I could be wrong about this. Um, there's nothing there's nothing here that actually proves to me that the third eye her story, which she claims. The Matrix is based off of has any connection to the Matrix, other than the fact she's that she's got this lawsuit going. I even looked at uh, the uh, the link up on Amazon. They don't have a synopsis for the for the I book. I guess you have to spend the money to find out just how Matrix. Is yes, <laughs> it's so brilliant, isn't it? You have to buy it and read it for yourself. Although maybe, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's a half decent story in its own right. I don't know. Does it have any reviews? Um. Mm. Let's see. She's also got a book here called Matrix Four: The Evolution, Cracking the Genetic Code. Uh. Okay. So. She's gonna get her ass sued off. Um, hey, you can't call the fourth installment evolution when the third installment was revolution. That just doesn't work. That would just confuse yep. people. Third Eye, Sophia Stewart, written in paperback, May 1981. Stewart's epic story created... Here's what the... Uh... Here's what the, the synopsis of the, of the book says on Amazon. Stewart's epic story created two of Hollywood's biggest franchises, The Matrix and Terminator movies, series and trilogy. See the court documents, letters of access, registered return receipts, FBI evidence, investigation, and future projects at www.matrixterminator.com. Robot Apocalypse. It's not the most original idea. Thank robot you. Anybody can think of a robot apocalypse. It doesn't mean you're ripping off other robot apocalypses. It just means you're 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 not a very original human being. Which fair enough on the part of the Wachowskis and even James Cameron, sure. 
But you can't, that, that's like saying that, I don't know, fucking. But guess what? Also, it's a, it's been made famous a case that the Terminator franchise was also inspired by another author, Harlan Ellison, who was writing way before Sophia Stewart even had a writing career. Robot apocalypse. <laughs> Chill the fuck out, you guys. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Is it so, apocalypse? Apocalypse. Apocalypse. I, I guess I... I guess I bring up all this up as a sort of an interesting side note. Um, uh, when talking about the Matrix films, I is it because okay? So because there's there there were similar ideas that came before. Does that make them necessarily bad movies? Like uh, a lot of the fans who backlashed against it said. Again, no, that does not necessarily a bad movie make. That's like saying every. That's kind of... You're going to have to make that case with Star Wars, which uh, which had movies before it, that it was formulaically ripping off. Like The Searchers, Westerns, believe it or not. Many a fantasy um, movie. Huh? Many a fantasy movie. Many, many a fantasy movie. That's but The Searchers... Movie. But the searchers is a western they like to they particularly like to point at. Anyway, yeah, uh, it was it was a fad. The Matrix was a fad. It came, it went, and I can respect it for what it for what it was trying to do. For the record, as bland as Keanu Reeves was in the movie, and he was quite bland. Oh yeah. At, at least most of the other actors were also quite bland. Like, Trinity was pretty bland. Even Lawrence Fishburne, I mean, he, like, had a smidge in a personality. Like, this much. The, o the only one who wasn't bland was Hugo Weaving. He was the best actor in the movies, by far. Like, oh my god, he was having so much fun with that performance. He's the Eddie Redmayne of The Matrix. Because all of the Wachowski movies need to have a hammy, over-the-top, hilarious villain who wears black leather. And he's... Gowls. He, he's one actor that they like to that they like to frequently work with. It seems he, uh, they he returned for Cloud Atlas back in 2012, which I didn't think was a bad movie once I watched it the second time and stayed awake. Skipped the racist parts. <laughs> stayed stayed awake. Oh. Hugo Weaving was great in that movie when he was playing a white guy. What about when he was playing a white woman? Did that happen too? Yes, it, it did. It, it was so hard. I, I was distracted by the yellow face. He was playing... Like breakfast at Tiffany's flashbacks. No. No, which has well, well, it, it kind of... If, if, all those if all those actors are connected, playing different versions of themselves in different situations and yeah that's i guess that's what they felt like they had to do they but um they shouldn't have I, felt like they had other options you had a choice it, which was the uh point i'm trying to make is yeah um among the many characters played by hugo weaving was the nurse ratchet at the elderly home let's not really talk about cloud atlas because i feel like if we do it's just going to take us to a really uncomfortable place well, let's talk about Speed Racer then. There you go. Is Keanu Reeves in that? No. No. It's another Wachowski picture. It is. Oh my god. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's. Damn, they were a one-hit wonder, weren't weren't they? Was I the only one? Am I in the such an extreme minority that I I actually kind of liked Speed Racer and Cloud Atlas? Well, um, you're in uh, the minority. I... You're in the minority in that you watched Speed Racer. I actually enjoyed Speed Racer. Actually, I thought the the film was actually looked pretty amazing. I mean, uh, I I mean, it's been a while since I've seen it, but it just I thought the colors were nice and the, the effects were mind blowing. I mean, the racing was amazing and racing is never amazing. 
It's just NASCAR is not amazing. The fucking Cars movies are not amazing. It's cars driving around. That's all it is. Racing is not amazing. It's not like any other sport that can actually be exciting to watch. Sometimes. Really? Unless really? It's golf. Especially you're talking about the Fast and the Furious franchise, like a. My God, Mike, no, no. There's a reason they stopped being about races and just started. And they went to heist. The uh, yeah. we're, we're, we are driving cars as we do stuff, so. Uh. They they still do some racing in it, but not a main focus of it. Anyway, back to Keanu Reeves. Uh, Speaking of Keanu Reeves, uh, let's hop a little forward to a comic book movie that he's starred in. What do you mean, speaking of Keanu Reeves? That's the whole topic, Mike. <laughs> speaking of Keanu Reeves, let's talk I'm about trying to that for a little bit. I am trying to segue. I'm segue. It's a bad segue, sorry. You are a segue. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a compliment. 2005, ten years ago, Keanu Reeves starred in... The film called Constantine, based upon the comic Hellblazer that was released by DC Comics under the Vertigo label. Hellblazer. It sounds like Kevin Smith's parody of Hellraiser. And originally they wanted to call it Hellblazer, but at the time there was a film called Hellboy, and they were like, huh, that sounds too familiar. Really? So, so we'll just call it we'll just call it Constantine after the main character. Hellboy is the movie that sounded too familiar. To Hellblazer. There was no other yeah, movie yeah, that yeah. sounded familiar to Hellblazer that it was, caught their it, attention. I'm I'm baffled by it too, Jaden. I really am. You're not the only one. You're not the only one that's baffled by the title change. So uh, this film, I mean, there there was a huge fan base for the Hellbla plays, the Hellblazer comic, and John Constantine was this witty British uh, exorcist slash detective, and in the film they changed it just for Keanu Reeves to make a set in Los Angeles, making him American instead of British. Basically, what happens in the film, in a nutshell is Carrie plays John Constantine. As a kid growing up, he got his special power of seeing demons and and half breeds is what they call it where they're half angel or half demon and half human like in between worlds they can cross over. John Constantine goes around getting demons out of people and there's one case that he gets involved with and it goes talking about heaven and hell and his friends gets killed at one point by the demon's son and devil's son it gets really convoluted when it comes to heaven and hell and the demons and i still trying to grasp it but it's just it's just it is your concept. Well, if it well here, here is where uh, Jada. If you've seen this movie, you feel free to to make uh, uh, to make uh, any assertions about concept over over content because I was having the exact same issues as as Mike as Mike here. I uh, I didn't I, I noticed there was. There was a lot going here. They, they, they put a lot of effort into this film, and it, it somehow, it somehow, in the end, felt this actually just sort of felt convoluted. Like very the, convoluted, very I, convoluted. I, 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 sorry. No, just keep going, just keep going. I was gonna say. I felt, I felt like the first half of the movie was was easy to follow in terms of the story and whatnot. The second half, mm, uh, my uh, my brain just sort of popped out of the skull and wandered down to the bathroom. 
because uh, I, because uh, when it came back, uh, we're we're left with a message about um, about whether or not uh, about whether or not God has a plan for everybody, which. Uh, I, I'm I'm finding it interesting because a lot of the a lot of the uh, Keanu Reeves films that we've we've talked about thus far, or some of these bigger ones, um, they usually have connotations to uh, to religion, particularly Christianity, or in this case, uh, Catholicism. There's well, when's Hollywood gonna make a movie about Muslim religion? Let's be real here. And here's here's uh, the the whole time I was uh, for the first half of the film, Mike was there. I was just saying, I was doing my best Keanu Reeves impression, saying, "But dude, I'm Buddhist. What am I doing here?" <laughs> exactly. The movie might piss off some religious people. I'm sure it did. I it probably did. I saw the movie years ago, back when I was still devoutly giving a shit about Catholicism and Christianity, and I took some serious issue with the notion that God damns suicidal people. Like, if you commit suicide, you go to hell. I remember thinking that was really unfair, and also being struck by just how unforgiving God was about the whole thing. Like, damn, can't you just go to confession? Sheesh. I guess I'm less bothered by that now. Although I guess I'd have to rewatch it because I know I was definitely bothered by the way they portrayed suicide in the film. Yeah, was it, it was staggering. It just... It wasn't cause... like, I don't know, what's that Will Smith movie? Um, I Am Legend. Is that the Will Smith movie? The one, it, it dealt with suicide. Um... Well, that's the only one I know where Will Smith uh, blows himself up at the end of the film. But uh, I don't know about any other deals with suicide movies that Will Smith... The the point is, I don't think it was necessarily the worst thing ever. But God, Hollywood has some serious problems with romanticizing certain things. Like suicide and uh, self-harm. I guess that's kind of a hot, that's kind of a heavy topic to breach, but... Right. Yeah, because... It's something that I think about when the movie comes up. Right. Because apparently she didn't commit Sukai, she was murdered, according to her twin sister. And it just, it just, I, apparently in the film, her twin sister was, I can't remember her name, I think it was... Uh, her name was, um... Damsel McGuffin. Damsel McGuffin. That was her name. Yeah, plot point McGuffin chick. Because she comes in later on and is like, Hey, you're Constantine. My twin said your name at one point and we're connected. So we gotta help solve this case. You know, figure out what killed my sister. She didn't commit suicide. Mm Mm-hmm. And it just... Because apparently she was like under-influenced by a a half-breed demon... And, you know, putting thoughts in her mind, you know, trying to fool with her mind, and then fell off. Suicide, apparently. I don't know. I couldn't understand that part. Um, but what John, what Keanu Reeves' role as John Constantine, he does have this, like, graspy voice in a way. He's got, like, this, because he smokes a lot. Like, in the film, I swear to God, if you count the cigarette count and the smoking count, you would be... Because he's You're troubled. Do- he's a troubled and he guy. He doesn't care about the values of life. He like Fuck. he'll trap he'll trap little bugs in a cup and give them Santa Pan smoke. Because he's yeah, that's, that's how I that. feel. That's how I feel. That's how I, I feel like I'm in a cup full of smoke. God, that was it, that that was a little bit of the matrixy preachiness, only in a much more pessimistic way. Just like just seemed like that. Um, it just, I mean, what? 
it just I was flabbergasted by the film. It just I couldn't follow the film for what it was. I mean, sure, John Constantine has his power as a kid, and he's trying to, you know, he's done a lot of. I don't know, he's trying to make his way up to heaven, apparently. He's trying to do, like, good deeds to get in God's heart or something and try to get up in heaven instead of hell because he's done so much. I... Again, there's, like, one... confession. <laughs> Just go take a quick trip into the church. Come out, you're fine. That's what Christianity teaches. Just be sorry. God's supposed to be benign, damn it. Yeah. I just think it's gotta be so much about Christianity, then you might as well, like, you know, get the facts right. Yeah, with the with with the film, they're they're they they have this uh, they have this idea that okay, he's he's thinking if he gets if he does all these good deeds, then he's going to. Uh, then he's going to get into heaven, and then we have the angel Gabriel. The, the angel Gabriel, played by uh, played by uh, Tilda Swinton, the White ah, Witch. There's that and, outclassing. Mm-hmm. There's the outclassing Keanu Reeves, and she does she does that throughout the film. Yeah, she does. She totally does. You can tell that where she's like trying to like blast Keanu Reeves out of the room. Like she would. Stop putting she... Keanu Reeves in a room with good actors. I mean, and and it's just. And Gabriel has this huge part in the film, like, she's she's a half-breed angel, and at the end, there's, like, huge twist at the end, and it's just, like, it came out of nowhere. It was, like... Again, I question the, the actual legitimate Christian. Even I was most like, religious parodies do their research, you guys. I was just, like, oh, she turns out that way at the end of the film? It's just, like, it's mm -hmm. kind of She's she she loves uh, she she seems to uh, be rather sadistic in his in his pain at at one point his inner torment mm -hmm. and I was like what huh so <laughs> you're not the white I, witch right now Tilda Swinton pull it back pull it back she was oh she was white witching the role all the way up man and. Of course, the other surprise casting in the film is Shia LaBeouf as uh, Constantine's um, driver slash Psychic. apprentice. Let's see, there, that's doing it right. That's giving Keanu Reeves a couple actor who's not gonna outclass him. Exactly. Because I was looking like, wait, wait, I was like, wait a minute, Shia LaBeouf's in this film? It was like, this is like, after like Disney, like even Steven's Shia LaBeouf. Young Shia LaBeouf. He was doing a lot of bit roles in action movies at the time. Remember I Robot? Oh. He was, he was in, in that, that too. He was. He was, he, he was like this one character who was like this kid who who like sort of like talked back at people, and Will Smith huh. kept telling him to go home to his mom. Huh. Well, all right. I guess I vaguely recall it. Yeah. So, if, if for people, those people out there who don't like Shia LaBeouf, spoiler alert: he dies at the end. It's such a, it, it it's such a moment where I'm just like, oh wow, I care. <laughs> you don't care for Shia LaBeouf's I, I... character, you don't. And and here's the thing: I uh, I watched it first. I was like, okay, I'm flabbergasted. I showed it to James. And he uh, did a what I call a sleeping Sullivan, where he slept through the film. And I noticed something different about the second viewing. Um, on the DVD, there's an alternate ending to the film where they show Shia LaBeouf's grave and you see him as an angel flying into the air. At the end of the credits of the film, they do show that scene at the end of the credits. Like... It's not the full alternate ending, but they show that clip of John Constantine at the grave, seeing Shia LaBeouf turn into an angel and fly up in the air, fade out. And I'm like, apparently that was an important note to end on. Like, that was that was but, like, but does Shia LaBeouf get saved? It's like, oh, he turned into a half-breed angel, I guess. It's just, 
And I was like, wait, did people actually sat through to the credits and see that post credit scene? Like, what was I that building up to? Shia LaBeouf is okay. <laughs> He's okay. It I was just. This movie can be good. <laughs> I was surprised. Too by late. That. Like, I remind you, I reminded of that end credits bit at Pacific Rim where they re where they revealed that Ron Perlman didn't actually die, but that mm -hmm. worked because we actually gave a shit about his character. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's that was Del Toro, right? That directed that. So the thing with Del Toro is, um, they he said that he he wanted to bring, um, Constantine back somehow in future films and bring Keanu Reeves back as the character. I've read. Del Toro do Constantine. He, he did other DC movies at the time. He didn't he, like he did Hellboy, so it it was a, in that universe. He wanted to do like this universe with. Hey, you know that movie we sued? I want to do something with that. Uh yeah. But yeah, well, they're just... gonna have to wait for the TV show to go. To go out right. of out of the uh, public consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to see a good example of Constantine, go watch the TV series. Less of watch it. just smoking, which people have a problem with, but hey, at least there's less bugs getting secondhand smoke because he's yeah. just bitter. It, it's just, it's, the, the NBC, NBC show is way better than the movie. I mean, you can actually go on the NBC website and watch all 13 episodes right now. Mm. There might be a second season. A lot of people are like, it's canceled. It's fucking canceled. It's not canceled. I read there's through interview that going to do a second season and it's just like people are like overreacting there so what if a season that it was going to get canceled because it wasn't oh, oh. it lasted 13 it episodes and i was like so what if it lasts 13 episodes like 13 episodes just... is not so unreasonable a, a time no, like I... season they I've don't seen... often have like 30 yeah i've seen worse seasons where they just got canceled but yeah if you want to see constantine and action check out the nbc show um we have a connection in the show. We talked about briefly mentioning The Crow, and we mentioned Point Break, we mentioned The Matrix. This one guy, Chad Stolisky, he is a stunt double. He's a stunt coordinator. He done stunts for Keanu Reeves in Point Break, The Matrix, and Constantine. He also did stunts for Brandon Lee in The Crow. Oh. This leads into Whoa. so God rest we talked so we talked about how a cinematographer turned director is iffy depending on who directs what. This is a stunt double slash coordinator directing a movie called John Wick. Is that a fact? That is a fact. He started out as a stunt double. I don't this suppose a... I don't suppose he did any of the stunts for John Wick. I don't. <sighs> That's, that's funny. That's actually that's so. Weird. I don't think he did. I don't think he did. Because I've, I've read that uh, Keanu Reeves did 90% of his stunts in the film. I, maybe he did 10% of his stunts. I don't know. I personally like Danny Trejo's policy when it comes to doing your own stunts. Really, as, as much as you look tougher, there are stunt doubles who could use the work. You know? Exactly. You're letting other people get paid. You might as well. I like so, it. it I was kind of staggering about that fact. I was like, wait, this is a f directorial debut from a stunt double slash coordinator, which I never heard of in my life. But John Wick was a really good film that came out last year. Um, John Wick was... It appears that the, it was a team. It, it appears that it was a team of uh, uh, two there, there, stunt... There was another director, but he was uncredited for his directing in this film. Yeah, but Chad got most of the credit for directing. But yeah, it was a team. The other guy was David. Um, something. David Leach. Yeah, he he's also like a stunt double too. So, but yeah, it, it was a team. But All Chad right. got most of the got the credit. But yeah, John Wick. All John right, you Wick. guys. My the, the, God. This, this is my movie. Let me talk about it. Go. Shoot, shoot. Go. Lady needs to have a say. John Wick. It seems like that these past couple of years there have been a few movies that have come around that have really surprised the pants off of me. Like, I, I, I think that they're going to be bad first, and then I hear good praise about them, and so I watch it thinking it's going to be okay, and then instead of being okay, it turns out to be incredibly fucking good. It's happened uh. like several times. It happened with 
Peabody and Sherman. It happened with, oh, what was that other movie? Oh, Peabody and Sherman was great. I had the no evil, question about that. The Evil Dead remake, definitely. So oh, much better nice. than I thought it would be. Uh, uh, it was, it was decent. It was mm -hmm. decent. Yeah, it was decent. It was being creative with the source material. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's this movie, which, see, see, I don't watch a lot of generic action movies. Certainly not a lot of generic action movies with Keanu Reeves. And if you look at the plot of this thing, it's kind of so generic that you have to believe that they're doing it on purpose. And it almost seems like they are when you consider the centerpiece of it, which I'll get to in a minute. Basically, mm -hmm. John Wick is this ex-assassin who was like an assassin for all these gang members and he was considered to be like this big, unstoppable force that you hire who's like, even the mob bosses are like afraid of him. They don't want to cross him because he was bad news. He was kind of like, you ever watch Boondock Saints? Mm-hmm. He, he was he was the old guy in Boondock Saints, minus the fatherly plot twist, spoiler alert. Right. Not spoiler alert. All of you have seen Boondock Saints, right? Right? Right. I've seen it part way. Yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, mister. Anyway. Okay. So he he was he was that character and then he was uh, he's of course retired. He's trying to live a quiet life by himself, trying to escape from the madness. And he, he has a wife, but then the wife dies. So now he's all alone and then something happens. He gets like attacked by some people and like he that pisses him off, so now he's going on this giant quest, shooting down people, going through like all of the gangs and all the forces, being this unstoppable badass so that he can take his revenge. And that's the plot. And it's it's the plot to like every action movie, action movie ever made. It's, it's Yeah, it's, basically every revenge movie ever made. Yeah, that, that's like... But the thing of it is... The, first of all, there's the revenge itself. So he, he gets a new car... And the son of one of the gang members, gang bosses, who's Theon Greyjoy from Game of Thrones, which is funny, because Theon Greyjoy is such a douche in Game of Thrones, and he also, like, gets a lot of bad shit happening to him in Game of Thrones, so it was kind of weird seeing him play another douchebag who had bad shit happening to him, although less bad shit, which was a little disappointing. Anyway, so, gang boss's son goes to John Wick's house to attack him and rob him and steal his car. They steal his car keys, but on the way, Keanu Reeves has this little puppy, this little beagle puppy, and when they rob him, they kill the puppy! Oh. He killed John Wick's puppy, and he was yep. such a cute little puppy dog. Yep, and they Daisy. Just, they just, like, deal with the dog, and I was like, what do you mean deal with the dog? He takes out a goddamn club. Bam! Like, oh no! Well, maybe he's okay! Bam! 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 Oh! He's not okay! <laughs> yes. But that is the reason why John Wick goes after Theon Greyjoy. Because he was upset that he killed his dog. Yep. But the car, he killed his dog. And that is a reason to go on a big revenge quest. Yes. He does have this speech later on in the movie about how the dog was the last thing given to him by his wife, and it was the only memory he had left. Was had blah, 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 blah. But you know what? He didn't need to. He didn't need to because he had my sympathy from the get-go. You know? If a gang member kills your dog, kills, kills your puppy, you goddamn go on that revenge quest. Yes. Shoot up those get those mobster places. You, you, you go to town, Keanu Reeves. He killed a puppy. <laughs> he must die. Man, I gotta Rachel see this never, movie now. You you have Man, to. Greyjoy never kills any puppies. He kills two children, which is, you know. But he doesn't kill a puppy. He's not that yes. kind of monster. See, see, animal cruelty in films is very no, 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 no. Well, and when this film. Puppies. Don't you kill anything. Puppies. You are the most hated creature ever. You cannot it, possibly do a worse thing than kill a puppy. I was, I was, like, so surprised when they actually revealed that. I was like, no, they're not gonna kill a puppy. What's the revenge gonna be? Oh, that's the revenge. And Actually, date it. He's like the puppy lives. And it's like. The was like, oh no, the puppy's in danger. Oh, he's fine. Of course he is. This puppy is not fine. He's dead. It's it's, it's the whole reason. Oh. 
It's, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's actually, you know, a saddening moment, and then you're like, you better get that fucking revenge, John Wick, you get that revenge. It's well done as far as revenge quests go, you know? Like, like, kind of like Taken, Keanu Reeves does have a pretty good badass character going for him. There's, like, one bit where he, like, has, like, five guys break into his house to try and kill him. Yep. The boss doesn't want Keanu Reeves to kill his son. I personally mm-hmm. would hand my son over if that were the case, especially if he was Keanu Reeves. I don't know why the mob boss cared so much. Like, just, here, take my stupid son, go away, John Wick. But, like, he kills five guys, and then a police officer comes in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's the best part. So he sees, like, dead bodies, and he's like, oh, hi, John Wick, because he knows who John Wick is. And John Wick's like, hey, I was just doing stuff. And he was like, okay, well, good luck with that. <laughs> he's like... <laughs> None of my business. You're a monster guy. I thought that was kind of clever. And that was. That was hilarious. Why aren't the police handling this? Because John Wick is that fucking dangerous. Yeah, they know John Wick's reputation. And I also... It also ties into the whole thing that kept coming up about Keanu Reeves' acting. Like, I, I purposely brought up Dracula because Dracula was the worst example. Yep, yep. But in this movie, Keanu Reeves actually manages to act. You know, may- maybe it's because it's really hard not to feel emotional when you're holding a little dead puppy. But, but like, there were moments where I was like, holy crap, he's actually acting. It's not like, you know, Joan of Arc or anything, but it's mm-hmm. acting. He's, I see emotions in his face. He actually gives a shit. There's acting. He's a human being in this. He's not just an actor playing a character. It really surprised me. Like, I really, he, he actually did brooding in an effective way that was accessible. And I was like, poor for you, Keanu Reeves. You go, Keanu Reeves. Yeah, it was actually a really gosh darn role. He just, he, he made it. He clearly had a lot of passion for the project. Yes, that's what I was going to say. He had a big passion for this movie. It was just, it was just... I was just flabbergasted. I saw it three times. Once in a theater, twice when it came out on DVD. It was that... And... <laughs> there's a lot of people counting the deaths in this film. How many... He's such a badass. Let's do a body count. Mm. One puppy. Uh, yeah, one one puppy. One puppy, about 80 people. <laughs> about... Which is about, like, you know, even. 80 people, one puppy. Yep, it just about... <laughs> We need revenge quests about killing dogs. Because, yes. You know, this um this film that, does amazing world building. They set up that John Wick is of course these this ex assassin who works for this like big assassin like not corporation but this like this formation enterprise like enterprise yeah like some kind of enterprise where he goes to a hotel and he meets this hotel um, teller. And he just, like, he knows the John Wick, and he's like, here's your... And he gets, he's got gold coins, like a stack of gold coins. He distributes out to, you know, the, the hotel person or the cleanup person who cleans up the bodies, you know. It's like this world building that should lead up into this big franchise. It's like, what, what's behind all this? We don't know what's behind this world. It's like gold coins, this, like, what is this be- underground, like, assassin world that we don't know of? And we have uh, we have this movie and a sequel coming out. Yes, I was gonna to say they're they are working on a sequel to this. I don't know about a sequel to John Wick. Like, what's he gonna do? Get another puppy? He already <laughs> killed the young Greyjoy. By uh, the it's way, gonna be, it's, spoiler: it's, it's, he kills the young Greyjoy. Oh, uh, <laughs> we didn't see that coming. I yeah, because was very unsatisfied. Like, basically, he just shoots him. I kind of yeah. want a little more of like what he got in Game of Thrones. Like in Game of Thrones, he's like captured by the enemy and put in this dungeon and tortured horribly for like an entire season. He gets dismembered and like reduced to like this this wobbling mess. I I mean, if he killed a puppy in Game of Thrones, I would not have a problem with any of that. Just getting shot, come on, like do something creative. Put him in a wood chipper, throw acid on him like that scene in Robocop. (laughs) <laughs> Give him a grizzly death, damn it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it it does what it does. I mean, I mean he's an ex, a retired like assassin, and there's a line that I, that I really like. And he's like, people are saying, "Are you back? Are you back?" And it's like, "I'm thinking I'm back." And it was like, like the closest to Arnold Schwarzenegger saying, "I'll be back." 
Like, I'm thinking I'm back. And I just thought that was a killer line he I, did. It was, like, very emotional, too. It was, like, a yeah, very... He was pissed off. Like, I'm thinking I'm back. Yeah, very pissed off. It was, like, perfect. I was like, I, oh, my I, God. I kind of wanted him to say, bitch. Or, yeah, some kind of curse at the end. Like, uh, so, yeah, the, there's John Wick 2 coming up. And then the same director, like I say, Chad, he's actually going to work on another film possibly rumored to direct a film called Cowboy Ninja Viking. Cowboy Ninja what? <laughs> Cowboy Ninja Viking. It seems like this guy knows how to take action movies and like push them completely over the top. Exactly. Over the top while also being played straight enough. Like it felt real enough even though there were elements of it like who makes a revenge plot over killing a dog? Like honestly. Exactly. It's and it was just, it was a great directorial debut. It looked really, you know, stylish, and it was really good-looking. It didn't have any flaws in it whatsoever. I highly recommend John Wick if you really want to see his current film status. See what Keanu Reeves is actually capable of. Yes. And prove once and for all that he really doesn't give a shit in those other movies. Exactly. It's not just the lack of talent anymore, Keanu. You're out of excuses. Mm-hmm. Um, there you go. Yep. Otherwise, you know, there's another fact that, you know, Keanu Reeves is still good friends with Alex Winter from Bill and Ted, you know, and he's done, you know, bit parts for Alex Winter in his film projects, you know. There might be a, like, there's actually, like, a cameo appearance in Alex Winter's Freaked. Oh, played, yeah. Where he played a, a dog boy. Yes. The uh, the directorial debut of Alex Winter was a, a sort of this cult film, cult bomb of a film called uh, called Freaked in which uh, Alex Winter is a, is a subject of toxic chemicals and becomes a, a freak of nature along with other freaks of nature uh, one being a, a sock puppet man played by Bobcat voiced by Bobcat Goldthwait and Keanu Reeves in an uncredited role as a dog boy but uh, gosh darn it if he uh, I have seen this film and if he I, I will say this. If he did not uh, put his all in all into this role, nothing, you can't say anything about early Reeves' career. Uh, let's see if I can pull up a picture of it even. Uh, Ke Keanu Reeves' dog boy treat. Oh, God. It's it. If I could describe it, what he looks like, kind of looks like those um, those real life dog face people where it's all fur on their face. Kind of inspiration uh, from that. But yeah, I just figured I'd mention that uncredited cameo in that film because people would be like, "Whoa, he did that too." That was at the time where he was doing all these all these '90s films. You know, he was doing all the doing the Point Breaks and the Draculas and the Speed and the Matrix. Matrixes. A... All... So he's like, why is he in this film? He's so popular now in the 90s. I was like, it's all because Alex Winter is his friend. Poor Alex they... Winters. How did he become the less popular actor of the Bill and Ted movies? How is that fair? How did well... he become the other guy? Where well, Keanu ends up being Keanu Reeves. I think part well, of it is Freaked happened. Um, probably. That's how. That's how massive of a failure it was. But I, uh, I, I, I find the the film to be entertaining as hell just because it's so. It it's so, it's so re enjoyably ridiculous. Maybe there was another reason. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, He's oh, like, I don't want to do be. The Matrix. Maybe we shouldn't put this on your resume, Keanu. 
Hey, yep. There we go. When you've got uh, <laughs> when you've got other characters in the film that uh, look like this right here. You have to ask yourself if you want to stay credited. Oh yeah, I'm not yeah, that's my computer right. Computer with this podcast so close to being done. No, thank you. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's all gonna be in the podcast, anyways. Mm-hmm. It's it's actually the picture between you guys, so you're just like in between the images. Yeah, if you. I swallowed my microphone. Yeah. <laughs> that's how shocked I was. Yep, so Keanu Reeves, he's grown as an actor from what he started as. It's hard to get mad at him, you know? Mm-hmm. He, he's not something you should just get mad at. He's he's doing his damn hardest when it comes to acting, you know? John Wick is a great example of that. He's, if he's got the passion for it, he can wham out a good role. If you just cast him in a movie because he's popular and you don't really give him much to do, he's gonna do a crappy British accent. Exactly. 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 Um, That's the moral here. Give mm-hmm. a shit. That is the, give a shit and that, you will yeah. prosper. Yes, give a shit in acting and then you'll exceed in life. You'll exceed in deed. You gotta give shit to get shit. Otherwise, um, that's it for the Keanu Reeves episode. Next time, we're going to talk about Eddie Murphy films. The iconic Eddie Murphy. And we will have both Matt and Morgan on the episode. It's so going to be so long and so late in the night. We'll see how long it takes to talk about five films of Eddie Murphy. Who knows? Especially with Morgan being such a knowledge of films. Yes, he is. He so, is a knowledge. So much. So, so much. He has become what he has researched. And that's not a bad thing at all. Nope, not at all. This has been Cinema Royale on Mike Mixtape. See you at the cinema. Ciao for now. Don't believe me, just watch. Okay.